Daniela Norris on All Books Presents podcast and interview series. We publish great books on the mind, body, spirit connection. And my guest today is Ali Norell, author of the book, The Truth Inside. Hi, Ali. Hi, Daniela. Oh, it's great speaking to you. I must say we've been in touch for a while and I um, feel like I know a lot about you and your story and um, I can recognize some of it in my own experience because you write about loss and grief, but also about hope. Can you can you share your story with us? Yes, of course. Um, and thank you very much for having me, Daniela. Um, so my story really begins back in 2014. I uh, had two children at that time and uh, we had our third child in March 2014. We've actually just passed her birthday, the 26th of March, and uh, everything was fine. Perfect pregnancy. I've had all four of my children now, four home births, four different houses. Uh, silly point of interest. Um, so it was perfect pregnancy, perfect birth. Baby was completely healthy, no problems at all. And when she reached, her name was Romy. We called her Romy and uh, actually the middle names we chose for her was significant. We didn't realize how significant at the time. We gave her Sylvia and we gave her Satya. All our children have a Sanskrit middle name and Romy's one, Satya, the meaning of Satya is truth. And we just felt that was important and we weren't quite sure why, but we also thought it sounded really nice with the other names. So uh, everything was lovely. My life was perfect. Uh, it's exactly the point in my life that I'd sort of waited a long time to reach. And when Romy was just short of four months old, she was around 16 weeks old. We went out one morning. It was a very, very hot day in July. I dropped my two older children off at school and nursery. And we were just about to begin the summer holidays here in the UK. So it was sort of my last day before the chaos started. And uh, I write about this in the book and strangely, I said, I used to talk to Romy a lot when we were in the car on our own. And strangely, I said to her as we drove off that morning, well, Romy, this is our last day together. It's a very odd thing to say, but I actually meant it's our last day together on our own before the holidays start. But that is exactly what I said to her. And we went to a cafe, we, she sat on my lap, she was laughing and we was, I was singing to her, I was eating with her on my lap and, um, and I suddenly noticed at some point that she didn't want to breastfeed, I was breastfeeding her at that time, thought something was a little off and just thought it was the hot weather, it was such an incredibly hot day. So I made the decision to sort of pop her in the car, drive back home, I thought I'll sit in the living room where it's nice and cool and try feeding her again. It's very unusual for her not to want to feed. And uh, I'm cutting sort of bits out here of, of the story as, as it goes along. But when I got home, uh, I had a lady cleaning my house, which I didn't normally have at that point, but we were, we were thinking about selling our home. And she'd come in to do a big clean of it because, you know, having a new baby and children, it was a real mess. And I got in, I greeted her, I, she was just leaving. I said, oh, would you like a coffee before you go? So I went into the kitchen to make a coffee and Romy was asleep in her car seat. So I put the car seat carefully down on the living room floor and went into the kitchen to make coffee. And I heard this really strange noise. And I actually thought at that point that it was our cat being sick. And I went to look for the cat, but it wasn't there. And I came back into the living room because at some point something in my head said, surely that can't be Romy. It's such a strange noise. And I came in and um, she was blue and it was her making the noise. Her breathing was obviously in, in severe difficulty. And uh, really most of what happened after that point for quite a long time is, is quite blurry. It took me a long time to get things out of my head to write into the book. Uh, but I obviously went into a state of very deep shock panicked and if I hadn't had that lady in my house who just so happened to also be an air stewardess and very well versed in first aid she flew into action called all the relevant people um, we were taken to the local hospital here in Brighton who were amazing um, but they didn't know what was wrong they just knew it was some kind of brain issue uh, this all, all at this point I was just thinking well, she'll be fine. She's just had a fit. It's some kind of fit. She'll be absolutely fine. They're going to tell me what's wrong and then they'll fix it. And at one point in Brighton, uh, one of the doctors turned around and said to me, you do realise that your child is very seriously ill? And I said, well, no. What, what's wrong with her? And he said, well, we don't know yet. We have to send you to London to see a neurosurgeon. But if she even survives this, she'll be severely brain damaged. And at that point, I think I collapsed. Um, 
and we were blue lighted to London. We were there overnight. And the following day, after lots and lots of discussions with lots of different doctors and a fabulous one of the best neurosurgeons in the country, uh, we had to make the decision to turn off her life support machine. And so the whole thing was obviously a huge shock. And what I wrote about was funnily enough, not so much of what I've just described, but what happened afterwards. So I sort of always had a, an interest I brought up I was brought up interested in spiritualism and very open to that. And I can't, it really starting from the moment that Romy actually passed, we were holding her in our arms, we were alone in the room. And there were some very unusual things that, that started to happen. And I would say even up to this day, I know that this is my belief system and so it makes sense to me, but I've had many experiences that I think even a, a real skeptic would struggle to find an explanation for and uh, they helped me they helped me in my grief spiritualism helped me in my grief I don't have a cast iron um, commitment to spiritualism or to any religion for that matter I respect any spiritual practice but um, in short the book is about the fact that I believe that my daughter's spirit continues and that uh, I found purpose in my life by trying to hold on to the belief that there is something that I needed to learn from that experience on a spiritual level. Um, and that perhaps if I could help other people who are experiencing the agonizing pain of grief to open their minds a little to those ideas, then hopefully it would it would help them a little in the way that it's helped me. Wow, what, what a story. There's nothing <laughs> one can say to, to a parent who lost a child um, that would um, begin to convey um, the pain and the grief and, and the terrible experience that goes with it. But um, because you have uh, this belief system, perhaps um, the death of your daughter was some kind of um, uh, assistance or help to you to get on your path. Uh, this was my experience in my case. And mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, share as much as you can about what exactly um, in the passing of Romy has helped you go back to this um, interest in spiritualism or what in spiritualism helped you deal with the grief. Um, yes, that's a really great question because, you know, that was always there. You know, I grew up um, having experiences. You know, I used to speak to my grandfather who passed when I was four years old. I used to regularly speak to him and it was only when I was about 14 and I actually, I believe that I, I saw him one night. I woke up in the middle of the night and he was standing at the end of my bed. That's, you know, it was completely out of nowhere. Um, so I'd had these experiences my whole life. But after Romy passed, I think it's fair to say I didn't automatically think, great, I think I'll go to a medium, I'll go to, you know, I was in pieces. I, you know, my whole world had fallen apart. If I didn't have two existing children, I'm not sure I would still be here. I mean, I, you know, I, I really, I felt like I'd had my soul ripped out. I mean, anyone who may be listening to this who's unfortunately had the experience of losing a child, any bereavement is incredibly difficult I know this but um there is something about but as a mother losing a child you've obviously created and grown this child it that child feels such a part of you so to actually not have that child there physically is is very very difficult but I uh I went to a local spiritualist church on a whim probably about six weeks afterwards I really still wasn't in my right mind and I remember I went there that night, the lady, the medium who was on the platform giving a demonstration of mediumship was perfectly lovely. But I remember just feeling for the first time in my life incredibly out of place in that church. It was a place that I'd visited before. Um, the, the medium doing the demonstration was, was great, but I was just, I couldn't wait to get out of there. And when I got home to my husband, I burst into tears. And I remember I said, I am never going back to one of those places again. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. I just had this sort of negative rant about it and I couldn't really make any sense of it. And three weeks later, or thereabouts, one Saturday afternoon, I was doing something with my husband and the children and I suddenly just said to him, oh, do you mind being with the children tonight? I'm going to go to the spiritualist church. And he, he looked at me and he said, would you mean the one that you said you were never going to ever again? And I said, yes, I don't know why I've just said that, but... Um, 
I don't even really want to go. I just feel like I have to. Those are my words. And so obviously he said yes. And I drove there on my own in my car. And while I was in the car, I talked to Romy. I used to do this when she was alive. She was in the back of the car. And I, I had this conversation with her and I said, okay, I don't know why I'm going here tonight because I said I was never going back to this place. But um, I know you're okay. I know you're okay. In, in my heart, as your mama, I feel that you're okay. But I just need it to hear it from you. I need to hear you tell me that you're okay. Those, that's exactly what I said. And uh, I got to the church. It was really packed. There were lots of people there that night. The lady doing the demonstration was a very, uh, uh, let's say, a very, very lively personality. She worked very, very quickly. She explained that she was firing out lots of different messages to lots of different people and to if you felt overwhelmed by that to see her afterwards and ask questions and i was right at the back and uh i remember again feeling strangely out of place there and kind of like why, why am i here and i looked at her and i thought she's going to come to me first i know she's going to come to me first she has something this woman has something to say to me that's why i'm here and she did come straight to me and uh it, the message was very brief and she gave me a few pieces of information that you know okay I was trying to be quite skeptical about them she mentioned the locket I wear around my neck with my daughter's photograph and lock of her hair in you know that was hidden by I deliberately put a big scarf on so it was hidden she mentioned those and then she said to me okay and um, that's all I have to say to you but I'm being told that I have to say some specific words to you and it's very important that I say these exact words and I thought okay and she said all I need to say to you is I'm okay and that is probably of all the uh, information I've been given it was like a thunderbolt and I just thought okay I, I was reeling I left that place reeling and I just thought I, I can't, you know, I believe this stuff, but I'm always looking to try and disprove it because I don't want to be dependent on it. Does that make sense? Um, yes, I think, was, I think uh, man, many people don't talk about these experiences unless something so powerful and, and terrible happens yes. to them. Yes. Um, so I, you know, I just could not get it out of my head. I couldn't, I was like, well, you know, I literally was thinking on the lines of, is there some kind of recording device in my car? Is that, you know, did I have my phone on? Did I, I just couldn't believe that she had said that to me in those words. And that for me was a huge turning point. And after that point, I started to visit the spiritualist church more regularly. Um, I found it a relief that I kind of just turned up. I didn't have to explain to anyone that my daughter had passed. It was still very recent to me. I found bizarrely in my everyday life I was finding the need to blurt it out to poor innocent people <laughs> in shops or you know just asking about my children oh yes I've got two children and one who's died um I, I was in that sort of mode in my grief but in that church I could just go in and it would come up sometimes I would get a message and it would come up but nobody would ask me people were very respectful and I just felt very comfortable and at home there and so for me um that was a huge turning point and it it, it um, directed me to the spiritual church and uh, today I, I don't go every week anymore but for a very long time I went every week now I tend to go when I just feel drawn to when I feel drawn to I just think well I think I might just go along to that meeting tonight because I feel as if I need to be there for some reason and um, so yeah that's it definitely put me back on that path definitely and um Perhaps going to a spiritualist church is, is something that um, some people don't feel comfortable with um, after they lose someone. Uh, could you uh, perhaps um, describe to someone who maybe is listening and hesitating whether um, this kind of spiritualist experience is for them? Um, how did it make you feel when the medium came to you and gave you those exact words. What in her words uh, made you commit perhaps further to the spiritual path and, and write a book about it? I think it was the fact that it was so precise. And I'll say now that that isn't always the case, as I'm sure you know yourself. Um, sometimes uh, my understanding from having done mediumship a little myself is that um, one will get a message either visually or orally, uh, every medium works in a different way and really the, the let's just say the the strength of the communication from 
the loved one in the spirit world really has a lot to do. It's all in the translation. So how the medium is translating the information that they are seeing or hearing and then giving it to the recipient. And sometimes that can come across as a little vague because they may not be quite understanding or fitting all the jigsaw pieces together. Um, so for me, that particular message, it was so precise. I had asked my daughter on the way to the church to tell me that she was OK. And the woman said, not only did she just say, well, I've got a message from somebody who's saying they're OK. She said, I have to tell you these precise words. And she just said, I'm OK. So I, I've had lots of messages in my lifetime. I've worked with mediumship. I've been to lots of mediums. For me, that was earth shattering. I, um, it, it just felt like a complete thunderbolt. And I spent a long time afterwards really trying to work out in my head how I could disprove that or how it could be fake or wrong. Um, but I just can't I can't find an answer for it. And at the end of the day, I wonder whether anybody can, because none of us actually know what happens uh, after we leave this earth. Um, I think probably perhaps people, some people think they do, but um, I, none of us actually know because we haven't done it. And so none of us can prove or disprove it. And so I also came to the point where I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have to be open minded about everything and search for its meaning to me. And uh, the point I always come back to is, did that experience help me in some way? Is it meaningful? Has it filled my life with more positivity or hope? If it has, then it must be a good thing. And if after I pass, I find out that it was all a big practical joke, well, never mind, because <laughs> I, won't, I won't really need to use it in that way then anyway. So I really, you know, I, I've kind of let go of the need to sort of justify it to other people. And and I hope I've been very careful in my book to, you know, to, to write in such a way that allows people to make their own minds up. I would never want to preach this as the truth ironically because that's in the title of my book uh, the truth i refer to in the title is the truth that Romy put me in touch with that's my truth we all have our own truth in my in my opinion so um yeah i would say if anyone's sort of wavering and a, a few of my dear friends um accompanied me to the spiritualist church and, we, and they have all sorts of different practices and none uh, one of my close friends uh, is um a practicing jew and she came with me um, and, you know, found it a very interesting experience and was very open to it all. So I think if you just go with an open mind and understand that the people there are friendly and welcoming, some of them are a little quirky, but I think you get that anywhere. Um, I would say, yeah, nothing. They don't turn the lights off and start wailing or anything like that. It's all very normal. You just <laughs> it's like sitting in a, a regular church with the exception that there isn't quite so much religious iconography around. It well, sounds like you got um, the specific proof that meant something to you that convinced you beyond all doubt that uh, the message was from Romy. And I guess um, I find that when people ask for proof and ask for specific proof that means something to them, um, more often than not, um, they get that proof. Is, is that your experience uh, as well? Yes, I, I, I think that probably is correct. I think um, I think it's all in the intention, isn't it, really, Daniela? I think, um, you know, if you've got somebody going to a medium who's saying, OK, tell me, I don't know, the old classics that you hear, like, tell me the winning lottery numbers or, you know, am I going to get married? It, you know, if it's not in your best interest to know that information, it won't come. But if somebody with a good intention is saying, look, please, I would like to know that my father, mother, sister is OK, and that they continue, please help me to understand that, then generally, yes, I think I think they will receive the, the quote proof that, that they're looking for. I guess we have to be a bit careful with the word proof, don't we? Because then people will start asking, speaking about evidence and so on. But yes, um, I, I guess I guess it's not about um, just about going to a medium and getting proof. Um, my understanding um, is that it's about continuing the relationship with your loved one on the other side yes. and getting perhaps um, this proof or this, these messages or uh, the feeling that, rela that the relationship continues directly through them. Did you continue your relationship with Romy um, over the past years since she passed to the other side? Yes, yes, absolutely. I've had all sorts of um, ex experiences. I uh, was having a, a, a facial <laughs> one day and I was in that relaxed state where they sort of busy, you know, the music's on and you're relaxing on the bench and I closed my eyes and I, and I saw her. I saw her in my mind's eye so clearly that happened to me twice 
And the second time I saw her, she had a baby with her. She had a, an older woman with her who I'd seen before. Um, and the older woman was carrying a baby. And I knew this baby was my son, who is now three years old. He's here. Um, and I went home and I said to my husband, you know, I, I've seen I've seen the baby and it's a boy. And I at that point, I had just found out I was pregnant. I knew I was pregnant just like very, very early. Um, and I, yeah, I've been for healing and the same thing happens and I've been for healing and I, I've got in, I guess my brain has gone into that alpha state, um, or the alpha, is it the alpha brain waves? They talk about where you're slightly relaxed, but not asleep. Mm -hmm. yep. And, uh, during, I've done that maybe two or three times. Every time I go for healing, I have seen her, I've seen her with, um, her grandfather, my, my late father-in-law who's, who's passed and with my grandparents and every time I see her she looks different so in fact on two occasions I wasn't sure if it was her I almost didn't recognize her and I realized that she was appearing to me as she would be if she were alive now if she were here now she'd have just turned five years old so um and I do I, I talk to her I buy flowers every week I have flowers on my desk next to where I write um I visit um her resting place as often as I can I used to go every week religiously but I don't do that anymore um and I definitely yeah there are lots of little little things that are significant to me um I had the uh, four framed photographs of all four of my children on the wall in my living room and for several weeks Romy's photograph I would come down in the morning and it would be at a really bizarre angle but it was the only one and I corrected it and then I'd go away and it never occurred to me to think of anything was um, strange about that. And it happened three or four times. And the fourth time I corrected it, I, I looked at the photograph and I said, it's you, isn't it? I know you're moving this picture. And it never moved again after that. So those are the things that I think, you know what, I'm pretty sure in my mind, you know, um, I'm pretty sure that those are um, signifiers to me that my daughter continues she's still around her spirit continues and that's very comforting to me obviously well it's all down to the idea that her loved ones are not lost when they die uh, exactly isn't it? i mean exactly. grief is is terrible and again there's nothing one can say to to a parent or or um anyone who's lost a loved one uh, to comfort them in that way but um your book which is about really uh continuing a relationship after death um if that is a good way to put it, perhaps you can <laughs> yes. explain it better than me. Um, that is a comfort to anybody who is grieving. And all of us will be grieving at some point in our lives. Um, exactly. That's just a part of fact of life that everybody will experience a death. Um, what would you say, um, perhaps to, to finish off, because I would love to speak to you so much more, but <laughs> time is running out. What would you say to um, someone who has lost a loved one, a child, or someone else um, very close to them um, about this first uh, period right after they um, mm -hmm. lost their loved one. What would you suggest? Um, well, I would say um, honor your grief, um, honor your grief. Um, and that means that uh, do not be the person who is pretending to be okay. If you are falling apart inside, you know, tell people if they can't, deal with it that's their issue and they'll just have to you know take themselves away from your your environment until they can cope with it I think that's what most of us do or perhaps it's very British perhaps <laughs> perhaps British people do this more but you know that sort of feeling of oh dear I can't I can't fall apart I can't or you know or you mentioned someone well, actually my my child died two months ago I've had that experience where I've said that to somebody and they burst into tears um you have to honor your grief you have to work with whatever you are feeling if you're angry just explain to people and be angry do what you need to do and also yeah i would say um keep your loved one alive don't shut down and never speak of them again i believe it's healthier to um, honor the spirit and the memory of your loved one in whatever ways are meaningful to you that could be just speaking to them you know i have a little special area in my garden for romy and the kids know it as well it's called romy's garden and we we go and sit there when we want to be quiet or we want to talk to her we put crystals there i buy her flowers every week so there are small little little rituals that i will probably always do i make her cake every year on her birthday um some of them may sound completely bizarre to other people but it doesn't matter I think that is the way that we can continue our relationship with our loved ones if we normalize that I think it makes grief 
a little more bearable. I really do think that. Thank you so much, Ali. And I can just add um, that um, checking out uh, Ali's book, uh, The Truth Inside, and perhaps finding, um, maybe not for the first time, but maybe for the first time, that uh, there is the possibility that our loved ones are not gone, are not lost to us. They're just different, and a relationship can continue with them throughout our lives. Um, how could people get in touch with you, Ali, if they wanted to? You have a website. I do, yes. Um, so my website is alienarel.com and uh, there is a contact form on that uh, on that website. And I believe in my book there are some contact details as well. So thank you so much. It's been lovely speaking to you today. It's my pleasure, Daniela. Thank you so much for talking with me. This is Daniela Norris on All Books Presents podcast and interview series. Today, my guest was Ali Norrell, the author of The Truth Inside. You can contact Ali on her website, www.alinorell.com and order her book, The Truth Inside, from your favorite bookshop or online. Thank you for listening.